The TurboGrafx-16 was advertised as the first 16-bit console, but was nowhere near as successful as its competitors. Where did NEC go wrong? Stay tuned to find out. This is Risky Bitness. Welcome to Risky Bitness. Today we're talking about the Turbo Graphics 16. If you like what you see, don't forget to like, subscribe, and enable notifications so you never miss a video. You can support the channel using the affiliate links below or by joining my Patreon, which gives you early access to every video. Let's dive in. NEC, the company behind the Turbo Graphics 16, started in 1898 as the Nippon Electric Limited Partnership headed by Kunihiko Itawade, a former telegraph operator who would become the face of the company, and Takeshiro Maeda, a salesman. Nippon Electric's business began with the manufacture, sales, and support of telephone switches. Itawade was born in 1857 and graduated from the Imperial School of Engineering in Tokyo. He moved to New York in 1886 where he worked for one of Thomas Edison's companies. My internet sleuthing turned up very little regarding Mr. Maeda. I suspect this is due to the time period and his work being less publicly recorded than that of Itawari. In 1899, NEC merged with Western Electric to become the Nippon Electric Company. In 1908, NEC entered the Chinese and Korean markets and expanded the telephone infrastructure in Japan from 35,000 subscribers when they first started up to 170,000 by 1915. NEC has a fascinating history, but much of it is outside the scope of this video. If you would like to see a video with more in-depth history of NEC, please let me know in the comments. For our purposes today, we're going to fast forward to 1978, when NEC released their first PASOCOM. NEC had built and released many different successful ranges of personal computers in addition to all varieties of consumer electronics, which were sold throughout Asia and North America. When toy company Nintendo broke into the video game console market in 1985 with the Famicom and was very successful, NEC saw an opportunity and wanted to get into this emerging market. Unfortunately, NEC had never been in the video game business and their management knew nothing about developing, publishing, manufacturing, or selling video games or game consoles. Meanwhile, Hudson Soft, a Japanese video game company, had been trying to sell advanced graphics chips to Nintendo with no success. Hudson Soft was founded by brothers Yuji and Hiroshi Kudo in May of 1973 as Kabushiki Gaisha Hadosun, starting in the business of making computer software. Hudson was best known at the time for developing Load Runner, but would go on to develop and publish hits like Adventure Island and Bomberman. When Hudson failed to sell their new graphics chips to Nintendo, but lacked the money to launch a console of their own. They instead wound up making a deal with NEC. Hudson would develop the console, and NEC would handle the manufacture and sale of the PC Engine. The PC Engine did remarkably well in Japan, outselling the Famicom year after year. It had strong third-party support due to relationships Hudson Soft had with companies like Data East and Konami. In 1988, the American division of NEC was directed to sell the PC Engine in North America. This kicked off a lengthy rebranding and redesign process. The PC Engine would not make sense to American consumers, and the small white system would look out of place in an American living room. The redesign resulted in a much larger and more futuristic looking black unit. In August of 1989, the Japanese model of the PC Engine hit the market in France just as the TurboGrafx-16 was being released in New York and LA test markets in the United States. However, the Sega Genesis had already launched in those same test markets by then, a move that spelled disaster for NEC, since a new 16-bit machine had beaten to the market. The timing couldn't have been worse. The Super Nintendo was also just around the corner. This didn't stop a limited 1990 release in the UK and Spain as simply the Turbo Graphics, but the console simply never sold all that well in the West. If being beaten to the market in the US wasn't enough, the marketing efforts for the Turbo Graphics 16 were not up to snuff against Sega, who was quick to criticize NEC for marketing the console as a 16-bit machine 
even though it had an 8-bit processor. The Turbo Graphics came in at a distant number 2, and it would be knocked down to number 3 once Nintendo's new console hit store shelves. Thus, a console with 16-bit graphics that was meant to overtake a market with only 8-bit consoles wound up being the only 8-bit console in a 16-bit market. Stay tuned for those hardware details. I was disappointed during my online research that I was unable to find much information about the people involved in these decisions. Knowing more about the key individuals involved and their backgrounds made my Sega Master System video a lot more fun to write. I think knowledge of the Japanese language and the ability to go through old Japanese periodicals probably would really help in a case like this, but it's something I really just don't have time to try and do right now. Even if I could find translations, it would be useful. If you do have the ability to read Japanese and would like to give me some information or help me out with some of that research, I'll be happy to make an update in a future video, and of course I'll give you some credit or we can do a collaboration. Pishi Engine is a curious name. After all, it has nothing to do with a PC at all. A name like that would definitely confuse consumers here in the US, but not so much in Japan, where the, where the common parlance for a personal computer was not PC but rather Pasukon. However, the PC moniker would not totally be lost there, and the engine part of the name comes from the intention that the device would act as a core of an expandable system. For this reason, the PC Engine is the smallest home console ever released, with dimensions of 5.5 inches by 5.5 inches by 1.5 inches. Multiple add-ons were planned, but only one ever materialized, the CD-ROM expansion which we will discuss in a future episode. A total of 139 games were released for the US edition of the Turbo Graphics, 121 of which were localized from Japan. The others are North American exclusives. 668 games were released for the PC Engine in Japan. The official mascot of the PC Engine was Bonk, known as PC Kid in Japan. This little caveman kid stars in a series of action platformers where he attacks enemies with his head. Most of the games on the TurboGrafx-16 run much faster than their NES counterparts or even many Genesis or SNES games. While some have pointed to the 8-bit CPU as a bottleneck for the system, this seems to only be true in some games. Many shooting games have adjustable speed, so you can make the gameplay faster or slower as you like. On that note, most games for the platformer shooters, many of them are arcade ports. These arcade ports are usually very true to the original arcade games, and many are not available on Nintendo, including ports of Sega licensed titles. A great number of the titles released only in Japan are based on popular anime or manga series. The Turbo Graphics definitely has much more processing power than the Famicom slash NES, and its games have a lot more interactive elements than its predecessor. For example, Bonk can climb up walls and swim up waterfalls. There are a few titles that feel like knockoffs of popular NES games that NEC couldn't license, but they generally improve upon the game they're imitating. Utopia allows the player to move in 8 directions, and Shockman can duck and shoot upwards. Further, many of the games released on the PCE had more fleshed out storytelling elements with cutscenes and dialogue. True to its name, the US version of the console has, a, has adjustable turbo switches on its controllers. These are not on the original Japan controllers, but were added to later models. The controllers are set up similar to the NES controller, with a select button, a run button instead of start, and Roman numeral 1 and 2 buttons instead of A and B. The PC Engine had 2 kilobytes of system storage available for save games. This is the first time a console had built-in storage. Prior to that, some home computers that were used for games had internal storage, but never before on a living room console. The PC Engine was followed up by the Super Graphics, an upgraded version of the same hardware. All Super Graphics games can be played in a PC Engine, but some have special enhancements that only work on the Super Graphics. Hudson Soft went belly up in 2012 and was purchased by Konami, who also acquired the rights to the PC Engine and Turbo Graphics branding. Recently, the Turbo Graphics Mini was announced, and that is released by Konami. Now, let's talk about what's under the hood. While the Turbo Graphics 16 was sold as a 16-bit console, this is an example of where this channel's name came from. That was some very risky bitterness NEC and Hudson pulled. You see, while the TurboGrafx-16 did have 16-bit graphics, it really was an 8-bit system. As a reminder, this bitness refers to the size of instruction sets that can be processed by the CPU. More bits means more complex operations and more possibilities. More game features, more action on screen, and more complex game modes. Why? Because the CPU, the most important component in any microcomputer, 
was an 8-bit Hudson HU6280A processor running at a blazing 7.6 MHz. This CPU was built on the Mo 6502 architecture, the same as the NES. So while this processor is much faster than that of the NES, nearly twice the speed, it is not a 16-bit processor. As we've discussed in some of our prior hardware videos, the number of bits was widely used as marketing to sell to consumers who didn't really know what that number means. What that means to gamers really is just that it can do more things at once, but to consumers, a higher number just means better. So where did that 16-bit moniker come from? It came from the 16-bit video controller, a Hue C270A, and a 16-bit color encoder, the Hue C6260. These two chips worked in tandem to make the TurboGrafx-6 beautiful display. The smooth and detailed character sprites and scrolling backgrounds could support up to 241 on-screen colors, for a total of 482 on-screen colors at any time. There is a total of 512 colors available altogether, making these games by far the most colorful games available in a home console at the time of its release. The Super Nintendo would come close with around 400 on-screen colors, whereas the Genesis could only display 64 colors at one time. Now, the Super Nintendo does have a much larger color palette, but fewer on-screen colors at a time, due to the lack of a dedicated color controller. The Turbo Graphics could also display up to 64 sprites with 16 colors each. The NES could output 64 sprites, but it was limited to 4 colors per sprite. While it could only display one sprite layer and one background layer, the Turbo 16 could make background tiles transparent, giving the illusion that the sprites are actually in the background. It's no wonder these games look so bright and colorful. The Turbo Graphics may still be the most colorful console of the 16-bit generation. We don't usually talk about resolution much here, but as we move into the 16-bit generation, it becomes much more important. If you're not familiar with how resolution works, it's measured by the number of pixels displayed on each axis. First the x-axis, or across, and then the y-axis, up and down. Higher resolutions mean better picture quality. CRT televisions could display resolutions of up to 720 by 480 pixels. Unlike modern LCD monitors and TVs, CRT screens were much better at displaying lower resolution images clearly. An in-depth look into how TVs handle game console images is a pretty big topic. If you'd like to learn more about this, let me know in the comments and I'll research it for a future video. The TG-16 was capable of displaying resolutions up to 565 by 242 pixels, though most games use the standard 256 by 239 resolution. The 565 pixel x-axis resolution was not used because it would look stretched on a regular TV. There are a handful of games that use the higher resolutions for still images or other media. Because of the limited processing power of these early consoles, the higher resolutions were generally not used for gameplay. Displaying such a high resolution image with lots of movement and action would have severe consequences on the processing power. You'll see similar numbers when we talk about the Super Nintendo later on. You may have seen higher resolutions like 512 pixels used for still images, and I think it was used a lot more for some of the CD games as well. I remember thinking the Hue cards were really cool when I was a kid. Uh, we reached these big bulky cartridges and the Hue cards were so small and sleek in comparison. We, we didn't know back then that the cartridges are mostly empty space. The Hue card media used for the PC Engine and the TurboGrafx-16 is just a little card about the size of a credit card, maybe a little bit larger, and the games are actually stored on there. Hudson first started developing card media for the, for the MSX computer with the B card a circuit board and a plastic housing with program data stored in EEPROM, or Electronically Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. EEPROM is something that, again, I think was a little outside the scope of our video here today, and I could go on at length talking about EEPROM and different types of read-only memory. But that's a whole different topic. If there's something you'd like to know more about, tell me in the comments. I can do much more deeply technical videos. As an aside, I do try to simplify a lot for these videos. One, because my time to research is limited, and two, because I don't want to turn you off with long, dry explanations of technology. If I'm going to really dive into that stuff, I need to know that people want to hear about it, and I also need time to make it more interesting and fun. The Hue cards could hold up to 2.5 megabytes of data. This is a tremendous amount more than the 8-bit cards of its competitors, and pretty close to what Sega and Nintendo would roll out with their upcoming generations. A big failing of the Hue card is that there wasn't much room for expansion. While the housing of a cartridge could be utilized to store additional memory chips, the Hue card had a hard limit due to its small form factor. 
On the other hand, cue cards are coated in a polymer that conducts heat, and because the cards are partially exposed when inserted into the console, they can dissipate heat without need of a large housing. The HU-C6280A processor was also responsible for the console's audio, using a 6-channel wavetable synthesis chip. I'm going to really simplify here because the technology of audio in this era is very deep and complex. Uh, it goes way outside the scope of this video, and again, if that's something you would like to hear more in depth, let me know in the comments, I'll research it for a future video. That might be a bonus video or something like that where I can get really deep into the very dry technical aspects of things. But if you want to hear something like that and see a video like that, I'll definitely do what I can to research it well and make it fun and more interesting and use a lot of more fun examples and things like that. Wavetable synthesis is still used today and is, in simple terms, the ability to create and manipulate waveforms in order to create various sounds. The wavetables are programmable in the Hudson CPU, which means they are that the typical waveforms found in other audio hardware like that of the NES are not the only options. Different waveforms can be created to generate a much larger variety of sounds. The audio is in 5-bit stereo, but two channels can be combined to play audio samples at up to 10 bits in depth. Which is why you'll notice that in a lot of these tracks, you have a lot more voices, a lot more different types of sounds than you have on your standard 8-bit audio. The result is a higher quality audio than any other consoles available at the time. I would place the Turbo Graphics above the Master System and even the Genesis in terms of quality, but it doesn't quite match up to the Super Nintendo, unless of course you count the CD quality sound of the CD add-on, but that's a story for another video. Now let's talk about the games. We talked before about how there were a total of 686 games released for the Turbo Graphics and the PC Engine, depending on the region. And of course, we did discuss a little bit about how a lot of those games are arcade ports, and a lot of them are shooters. The arcade ports are really, really high quality, and some really great examples of that are Kadash, the Dari series, Ninja Warriors, Splatterhouse, the Gradius series, and Ninja Spirit. There's also a tremendous number of shooters available for the platform, especially in Japan. We did talk about that a little bit before, how shooters were very popular. They're very popular games in the arcades, and they translated very, very well onto this particular platform. Now, some notable non-arcade entries are City Hunter, which is a Rolling Thunder-style adventure game, the Legendary Axe Parts 1 and 2, which are fantasy side-scrolling platformers. They feel a little bit like an updated Raskin Saga. I remember playing those as a kid at a friend's house. Alien Crush and Demon's Crush, which are pinball games. There are actually quite a few pinball games. Uh, as we discussed before, there's an excellent Zelda clone called Newtopia. Uh, that spawned a sequel. It's a fantastic game. It's actually very, very good. I would actually prefer that over, over The Legend of Zelda. Psychosis and Download are two shooters native to the PC Engine that are really, really fantastic. And it has really great ports of both Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu and Ninja You Can Do. Really great updates. I actually prefer the PC Engine version of Ninja You Can Den over the Ninja Gaiden for the NES. It is a real shame that the poor marketing left the Turbo Graphics in the dust here in the US because, as you can see, it was a really great platform with a lot of fun titles that we missed out on back in the day. I think it really could have done well up against the Genesis and the SNES if it had more financial support from NEC. There are a few real classics that are absolutely worth checking out, but overall, a lack of third-party support in the US means the library is very limited. The crowning achievement of the platform probably lies in Kumajo Dracula X for the CD add-on, but that's a whole other episode, 
and I'll definitely be doing an in-depth episode about that game. Maybe with the assistance of my good friend, the Bitkeeper, if you guys want to hear from him again. Now with the TurboGrafx-16, I only have one experience with the system itself before I got into emulation, and that experience is with a friend who lived across the street from me when I was growing up. He got a Turbo Graphics sometime, I think in like 1989 or 1990, might have been 91. It was definitely new at the time, so it was probably, probably about 90. And he had a couple of games for it. I know he had their Leg Legendary Axe 2, I think we played, and I think Bonk. He really didn't play too much on it. It was kind of disappointing. You know, the Super Nintendo hadn't come out yet. We hadn't upgraded yet to that of the Genesis. And it was competing with the NES, but we didn't play it very much. And I don't know if he played it too much, you know, when he didn't have company over or anything like that. It seemed like we always went back to the Nintendo games because it just had a much bigger library here in the US. I think that was probably the biggest downfall of the system. As cool as it looked and as awesome as the idea of 16-bit games was, as novel as the use of a card rather than a cartridge was, the library of games here in the US just, it was, it's a fifth of what it was in Japan, it just didn't match up. So I want to thank you again for watching this video and sticking with me to the end. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Share this video with your friends and leave a comment telling me what other games and systems you would like me to cover. Until next time, game over.